<laughs> Ooh. Mic check. Mike Hiller. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much for having us here today. All right, so my name is Kevin Wong. I use he, him pronouns. See how easy that was to use your pronoun? <laughs> I'm the senior vice president at The Trevor Project. We are the leading suicide prevention and crisis intervention organization for LGBTQ young people. Hey. I'm, that's very sweet. I'm not the celebrity here today. Um, so very, very huge welcome to Don't Be a Drag, Just Be a Queen. Can we have a round of applause before I do intros? <laughs> See that warm welcome? All right, I am very excited to be here in community with everyone. I actually think I see some familiar faces from today's Equality Texas uh, rally. I don't know if y'all were there. Um, a lot going on in Texas right now and a lot to talk about. Some of you already know that we're here to address some pretty serious stuff, but we also hope to bring some levity to y'all. Let's start with some intros. All right, Jada, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna go to you first. Jada Essence Hall, okay, after winning RuPaul's Drag Race season 12. <laughs> the applause has continued since then, by the way. Ah. <laughs> she has gone on to tour the world as the host of RuPaul's Drag Race Work the World Tour launched her podcast, Hall and Closet, and stars in RuPaul's Drag Race Live, Las Vegas Residency. All right, Simone, you're next. <laughs> okay, after her historic win on RuPaul's Drag Race season 13, she, yeah, she's continually using her reign to further her artistic expression. Simone's goals for her career go way past drag and into high fashion modeling and acting. Peek that look. All right, got Mick. An all around drag superstar, author, makeup artist, and trans rights activist. Do you remember doing a Trevor Project Instagram Live with us a couple of years ago? I TDOV? do. Yeah. I don't think I was in drag though. Was you, I? Your face. You didn't. You, you oh, 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 like here up. I was in drag. Right, right, right. Same. Yeah, no, I do. I fucking love the Trevor Project. Can I cuss? <laughs> 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 so I'm really excited Thank to be you. here today. Thank you very much. Guys, yes. Actually, so all of these queens have supported the Trevor Project over the years. We are very, very, very grateful to be in conversation with y'all today. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Before we get started, before we get started, I want you to know there is a Q&A portion. Please use the South By app, and you can um, enter questions in Slido, okay? Those can come in, they'll roll in throughout the talk, and then we'll address them at the end. All right, so we're gonna start with some Drag 101. Uh oh. Okay? Back to the basics. <laughs> okay. The history of drag is not exactly clear, but many trace the roots um, to the age of Shakespeare, when women's roles were performed by men. Uh, the origin of the term, drag, also hotly debated, but it is often suggested to have sparked when audiences noticed dresses or petticoats that male actors wore on stage would drag along the floor. So regardless of when or how it started, we do know that drag is nothing new. Drag has been around for a very long time, right? Especially, you're probably familiar with ball culture. If you're here, you might be familiar. Largely focused on LGBTQ people of color performing in largely underground competitions, and it's shifted to break into the mainstream. Today, most of us are familiar with the internationally televised drag competitions of RuPaul's Drag Race, uh, where que queens perform in front of millions of viewers, hopefully like this live stream. <laughs> okay, so that's why drag in all its forms is a huge source of queer joy for many, and I am one of them. Hopefully you are too. Y'all can make some noise for drag. Now we're gonna get into exact, you wanna hear from them, right? So we're gonna get into some questions. Can I have a round of applause for how eager you are to hear from them? Oh my God, they love you. Yeah. All right, so first question, let's keep it simple. What got you started in drag? I wanna start down the line. Simone, you're up first. What got you started in drag? First, um, all right, I was about 16 years old and mine was, I saw RuPaul's Drag Race, <laughs> and it was on, like, when it was come on at, like, night, like, at 12-something, on one of them obscure channels, you know what I'm saying? And um, 
I watched it and I and I was just enamored by it. I'd, I'd known who RuPaul was before that, but I didn't realize he had a show. And so watching the girls compete and throw a little shade and just be themselves on the screen that I kind of wanted that for myself. So I like, I got a job, I saved up my money, um, I bought makeup here and there, and I just taught myself how to do my makeup. And um, when I turned 18, I performed uh, for the first time and I've been doing it ever since. Did you hear that? I <laughs> wanted that for myself and look at her now. <laughs> All right, Jada, what got you started? Ooh. Well, my partner is right there in the audience sitting over there. Yeah. Yeah, and no. Stand uh, up. Uh, yeah, stand and up for everybody Stand up. up. Show, show yes. that. Yeah. Um, but um, him, his mother and him, they both were like, there was this competition where I could win $500 if I were to get in drag and like perform. And they were like, you should do it. I think you would be fun, phenomenal. And I was like, um, I don't really see the point of doing that. Um, it did, didn't make any sense to me. Um, but there was someone who was supposed to <clears throat> perform with me, a couple of people. They dropped out of the competition. They didn't end up performing, with, they dropped out of the performance and didn't perform with me. And I was like, you know what? I spent money on these things. I kind of feel like I still just want to see what it's going to give. So I went out and drag and like doing my makeup for the first time, like that fully expressing who I was. It, it was, I, I don't know, it was like a high that I just, that I never knew that I could have in my life. Yeah, it felt like it filled a void. And after that, it was her three. <laughs> As they say. All right, you're next. Yes. Well, I'm Gottmik, and if you don't know me, hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, I found drag, I think, through Paul's Drag Race as well, and I remember seeing that, but I am a trans man, and so I was assigned female at birth, and I never thought... I could ever do that. It was just not a thing. I'd never heard of someone assigned female at birth doing that, so I kind of just put it in the back burner. But just deep down in my soul, I was like, I know I would fucking slay at this, though. <laughs> so I would practice my makeup, and I just was a very like loud, psycho person, and I would start going out. I had a fake ID, and I'd go to all the bars in full dress drag I would call it looking back now I put quotes on that but um yeah and it got to this point where I was like people are recognizing me in drag thinking I'm a cisgender man and it felt so good to me and that was kind of like the opening to my trans journey and realizing that's probably what I was or who I was and so it's so weird without drag female drag that's how I found my trans male presence and soul in this world. So it's a little backwards in that trans drag story, but it is my story. And so I just can't thank drag enough for what it's done to my life. And that's how I started. Beautiful. Find your journey how you find your journey. Wait, was that the first sleigh that we had today? Should we put a sleigh counter up? First and last. I'm just, okay. I'm just kidding. No, there'll be a lot of sleighs for sure. Sleigh. All right, so that is how y'all started, how you got started in drag. But we want to know next, what was it like to do drag on a global stage? We could do the same order. For me, it was a little scary, I'm not going to lie. Um, that was... It was, it's scary sharing your art in that way, um, and it's very personal for me. So, um, but getting there and like rounding the corner and seeing RuPaul's face on the first episode, I was like, "Oh, honey, <laughs> you just gotta show up for Mother." So that's that's what I kept in my head. I was like, "You have to come, and Mother has to see you do what you do, and that's your top level, darling." And so I did, and I won. <laughs> and she won. All right, global um, stage. I, I think it was it was like like Simone said. I think it's a very scary experience when you remove yourself from everybody you know, all of your comforts, and you like completely submit to like this experience alone. And even though you're there with um, with the girls, it's still you make camaraderies with the girls, but it's still your for your for, for for myself in my life. That was the first time that I was by myself, and so it was very scary. But I think um, remembering how my family and my friends back home supported me it kind of made sense that I was on that stage because they've always believed that I, that's where I would be. And so I would work hard to be where they knew I could be, where I could see myself. And it felt right being at Drag Race. I don't know. <laughs> it felt right. Yeah, no, I would agree. It did just feel right for me too. And like I was saying earlier, I just didn't even know someone like me could do such a thing. So when I got that call that I was on Drag Race, I was like, oh my God, this is my chance to be that person and show the world that drag is for everybody so that was kind of like my 
main thing. I was like, I'm so excited to show. Like, I've worked so hard on my persona and my aesthetic, and now it's time to show the world, like, me, and that I hopefully people out there can relate to it and realize that drag truly is for everybody. And y'all did. Y'all did show that drag is for everybody, and you showed yourselves. How did that success help you tap into your communities? How did it help you help your communities? Whoever wants to start. Um, uh, well, at home, um, I think in, in it, for me, I always feel like drag has always been about community and like advocacy. Like um, somebody said it that like that drag queens are like the Marines of like the queer community. So, and and I feel and I feel like that's like one hundred percent. But somebody, um, I think that was definitely oh, RuPaul. <laughs> Well, look some, over there. Some, some bitch no said look that. Look over there. A common, a common quote. A common tactic. I'm just we need attribution <laughs> here. But um, I, I don't know. It's, um, it's just one of those things where you just feel like you have a sense of community and like you have to like pull up for your community. Like at home for us, even even in Milwaukee, we have like this this pageant called Miss Courage MKE where we raise money for like um, displaced youth that are LGBTQ or queer or any kind of way or trans. And so we just want to try to like there. I feel like we want to try to raise as much awareness as we can for people who we can. I just think in, in my life, um, um, it's not been the easiest road. And I think that for me, I see, I, it's easy for myself to see that. And I can see that in other people that they might not, they may need help on their journey. And so I feel like just giving a hand wherever you can in your community just feels like a serve for me. Um, yeah, I mean, being on Drag Race, obviously, it just gives you the most insane platform you could even imagine. It's actually more insane than I ever imagined until it happened. And so I got off of there and I just met so many people. I started traveling so, like, every day. I was like, another club, another club. Like, I was like, I'm going to go. I'd wake up and there'd be, like, a Delta app notification. I'm like, where am I going today? <laughs> like, it was that crazy. And I just got to meet so many people from, like, so like every gender spectrum every queer spectrum you could ever imagine and even if it wasn't like a trans guy storyline they were just talking to me about how it just my being open and honest on the such a big platform showed them that they can be open and honest with themselves and I learned so much from every single person I met and so even to this day my friends I'm like you're excited for the meet and greet, bitch. Like, that's the most stressful part for me. And I'm like, I need to meet everyone and hear every story. <laughs> and, like, need, I just love it. I just, like, love meeting you guys and learning about the stories. And it inspires me every day to keep being open and honest with my story. Because I'm learning every day, too. It's a journey. You know? Okay. All right. So next, this is actually a pretty good segue, talking about community and service. The elephant in the room. The political climate. Ooh. Ready to get into it? It's getting global warming there too in that climate. Oh. Baby. <laughs> Hot all around. Global warming is real. Yeah. Real. <laughs> also true. All right. Our country's political climate is increasingly hostile towards our community. So the LGBTQ community, the drag community. Uh, the Trevor Project is tracking more than 500 anti LGBTQ bills introduced in states across the US, including. Dozens here in Texas. So those are not exaggerations. More than 500 across states in the US. Dozens in Texas. If you're unfamiliar, the first few months of this year, just this year, we've already seen bills signed into law that ban doctors from providing trans medical care to young people. We've also seen other bills that seek to ban drag queens from performing in public. Boo. Yeah. Give that person a mic. Uh, and one was recently signed into law in Tennessee to restrict drag performances. I know, I know. Yeah. The Trevor Project continues to monitor these bills, obviously. We're working closely with state partners on the ground to push back against them. Regardless of whether these bills pass, though, it is important to understand that the ugly debates around them, they're taking a toll on LGBTQ young people's mental health. So one of our recent polls found that 71% of LGBTQ youth, including 86% of trans and non-binary youth, say state laws restricting their rights uh, have negatively impacted their mental health. So that's vast majority of LGBTQ young people and vast majority of trans and non-binary young people. So that's setting the stage, right? A little ugly. Some questions. 
has this wave of anti-LGBTQ bills, which has actually been a few years now, several years, uh, has this wave, including the drag ban in Tennessee, impacted you or your mental health? Whoever wants to start first. Um, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I'm from Arkansas, if y'all didn't know. Y'all me y'all's neighbor. And um, so recently there's been bills obviously passing and are trying to be passed. And it does affect, I, I, not necessarily my mental health, but like I think about all the people back home. Like I still have drag sisters back home and them fighting it. And I think about how drag literally saved my life. And for them to try and take that away from someone who just is so important to see yourself. And I think drag queens are that for a lot of people. And so to take that away, um, I think, I'm sorry, <laughs> is, is a detriment. And um, I, just, I, think, I just think about myself when I was 16, or no, I was 18 at the time, and I went to prom and drag. And that's how I was able to like exp finally feel like I could express myself to people and people could finally see me. And so all this hate and all of the, uh, these legislations coming by, I, I just think about the younger people and how um, if I if that was how important it was for me, how important it could be for them. So um, and also, <laughs> fuck Sarah, just Sarah Huckabee Sanders. <laughs> wow. um, well, I have to say, I do feel like in a lot of ways, like it's affected my mental health. Like re it recently, just my situation, like home wise, like dealing with a lot with my family, and so like you already have like a lot of that, like everybody in the world is already dealing with a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. And I think the last thing that people need to deal with when they're worried about paying their bills or going to work or education or their health is to worry about if they could, if they, if just them being who they are and existing is a crime or is wrong for them. And I, I like a lot of ways, I think um, I felt, I felt lucky because I've been able to be a part of the groundwork that people have laid before me to get to where I am and to be able to have the lifestyle that I do have. And so although this does affect me mentally a little bit, I do know that um, it's my time to get into the fight. I feel like I feel like it's my time to stand up for people in my community who might be like myself, who might have needed somebody before them to stand up for them and be a voice. And so um, I think that if you can in your community, um, if you can be a voice for people, because there's a lot of people around us that might not um, have the have the power to stand up for themselves. Some some people are like we have like our youth, our trans, our trans brothers and sisters who oftentimes are need the most protection and they might not be able to stand up for themselves. So. In my mind, I'm like, I'm a little worried about everything that's going on, but at, at the same time, I know that this is a time for a fight. And I'm ready to throw my hands up, honey. Ew. <laughs> yeah, um, honestly, the last round of bills has affected my mental health a lot, and it's just kind of just crazy, because, I mean, obviously, drag's my art, and being trans is my every who I am every day and my fight every day and what I want to keep pushing forward and fighting for every single day of my life so just like seeing these bills I just I, w I woke up the other day and I was like I'm just so tired of like people that don't even know what a trans person even is like putting bills into existence trying to like put us down and not have us express our art it's literally like a uh, it's freedom of ex it's it's freedom of expression literally and we're like trying to go backwards with that it makes absolutely no sense to me and so I just have to pick myself up and like Simone was saying, it's just like imagine me when I was a kid and not getting to see Drag Race or Marco Marco's runways in person and like all of that, that I was like changing my life and without drag, I would not be able to be who I am today. So it's just insane. And Peppermint, who's a amazing trans woman from RuPaul's Drag Race, yes. She just did an interview where she was, she like blew my mind and she was like, there's a poll that like 80% of people don't even know a trans person at all in their lives. So they're getting their information about what a trans person even is through these bills. They're just like lumping drag and trans people together, which is just 
literally so harmful on so many levels and insane. And so it's definitely like Jada was saying, up to us to be louder and prouder and ever and show these bitches who we are. And we're not going anywhere, no matter what you think you're gonna do with these little bills, honey. I love hearing that that laughter and that that queer joy and people were clapping for you. You were talking about queer joy in your example. Okay, something that Jada said, I don't wanna gloss over that. We are here because we stand on the shoulders of giants. We are not the first people to talk about this and we should give those people a round of applause too. Oh, it's not you. alcohol. It's Christmas. <laughs> it's oh. Christmas and fuzzy water. Thank you, pit crew. Are you guys drinking? Oh. Sparkling water. That? Are you guys drinking? No. Oh. <laughs> ne ne neither are we. <laughs> All right, like we're gonna stay on this for a second because I think this next part, Oof. this next part, y'all were kind of hinting at. You were talking about how this affects young people. Yeah. So y'all having the platform that you do, what would you say? to young people who are struggling with this difficult political news and their mental health? Ooh, I would say, um, I think that in our lives, there is never um, a, a good enough point for us to learn that we have to stand up for ourselves. I think at all. So I think um, in this time that this is the, for, for myself, I feel like there's been bills that have been passed and or that they've been attempting to pass that haven't been in our best interest before. But the number of bills at this moment um, and the number of like how how high the stakes are in this country right now is not a time to flop. <laughs> so I mean, uh, I don't, it's it's. It's, the, the, t the climate is wild, I feel like. Yeah, and I would say like, I'm, I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of me when I was really young and if this was happening when I was growing up, I feel like the more than anything, I would just feel so discouraged because I remember when I was trying to find my, who I was and if I was trans or something, it wasn't, trans wasn't like as... I don't know the word for like not popular, but it wasn't as normalized, I guess, the yeah, word is, as it is right now. And so in my brain, it was just such, it was almost bad. I was like, this can't be what I am. Like, there's no way. But luckily I had amazing queens and amazing trans women and people that were like guiding me and showing me it was okay. And so the fact that this is like, people are attempting to take such a thing away. I just feel for those kids so hard. And I would just say that, you're not alone. Open that TikTok app and follow drag queens. <laughs> and we are here, like I said earlier, we are not going anywhere. And if anything, we're just gonna be lo louder than ever, honey. Ah! I love that. <laughs> Any words of affirmation for <laughs> young people? Oh man, I would just say, you know, like basically what they were saying is, you know, just find people that you look up to and hold on to them. You know, that's, that's what I did. And, um, and know that you're not alone. We're here, and we we gonna still do what we do. So then that's not gonna stop us. And so hold on to your dreams, hold on to the people that you love, and hold on to the hope that everything is going to be going to be okay. Because you are not alone. We're always we're always gonna be here. There's what a legion of us now. <laughs> it's fifty eleven queens now. Yeah. So just no, hold on to that, and don't do not get discouraged by it. We there we have been trying to be. We have been trying. They have been trying. There Someone's we go. Down. Yeah, take us down. The grammar, the Arkansas grammar coming in. But um, <laughs> they've been trying to take us down for years, and we we gonna be here. We still gonna be here. And we still gonna do what we do. So don't get discouraged by it. You know, that's what I would say. I love that. I love that. Did you hear all of them say the phrase "You are not alone"? If I could, I don't know where the camera is, but if I could like direct a camera to you, a young person, it's true. You are not alone. They're here. Find them on TikTok. The Trevor Project is here for you 24-7, okay? We're gonna stick on mental health. Yes. Okay. It is so important to destigmatize conversations around mental health and to have open conversations about how we're feeling. It's pretty heartbreaking. The Trevor Project's research consistently finds that LGBTQ young people, they're at higher risk for negative mental health outcomes like anxiety, depression, and suicide risk compared to their peers. Every day, our counselors hear from LGBTQ young people who reach out in need of support. And as global drag queens, 
Your fans and followers often see your most shining moments on TV and social media, but we all have hard times, no matter how successful we may be. Actually, we were at dinner um, yesterday with Jada. We were talking about living your truth and having it be helpful for people to see other people going through maybe similar things, similar difficult times, and opening up the dialogue. So question for y'all. How do you protect your physical and mental health while being in the public eye? It's been years for y'all, so you must have something. Oh, I got one really quick, y'all. Okay, and this one is for everybody in the world, honey. It took me a while, but I'm learning that in order for you to protect your mental health and your physical health, honey, you have to set boundaries. And you not only have to be to set boundaries, you have to be willing to set boundaries and you have to be willing to stand your ground in the boundaries that you set and not let people allow to cross that. Um, I, I feel like I am very open with like the people out in my fans or the people who support me, everybody out there. I'm just very open about it because I'm like you, like I said, we said last night at dinner, you never know who could see your story and relate to you. And so I'm just, I, I feel like just live and be yourself. No, that is, absolutely, yeah. Just sharing that with people is a form of support for others, too. Yeah, I think setting boundaries is absolutely the number one thing that changed my life, for sure. And going hand in hand with that, it's checking in with yourself every day. Like, I didn't do that for so long. I was just always going, and I was like, oh, I do have boundaries. Like, I am, like, saying no sometimes and making sure. I'm, but, like, no, yeah, I have to wake up every day, do a little meditation. Like, are you okay? What do you need, like, emotionally? And that has truly helped me so much, especially with these crazy times going on right now, to just, like, check in and be like, you know what? You're not okay, and that's okay. You just need a second, like, you know, which we all do sometimes. So checking in, setting boundaries and making sure you're putting yourself first when you need to be put first is so important. I got to put me first, Lucius. <laughs> <laughs> she meant it. Any tips for folks on protecting their physical or mental health? I think all of everything that they said, but I found for me, um, through all the chaos and, and being out in the public eye, there's a lot of voices that come at you at a lot at all the time. And so I found for me personally, I have to be alone for certain periods of time to like watch my TV, eat my food, be in my room. That just helps me personally to ground myself in it and to like not take it all here. So I'm a I'm little sensitive. So I, that's helped me a lot. So like all of these things that they said and finding my alone time and, and, and watching the things that I enjoy and um, checking in on myself too, for sure. Also really fast, also I heard you say physical, which we didn't touch on because that is a real thing. And I meet so many people, amazing people who ask me advice for coming out and they don't have a safe space to come out. So when it comes to physical as well, I always just say, find your chosen family. They're out there and make sure you just have a really strong support system that when you do come out, it's going to be the best thing and it's going to be the most life changing thing in the world. But just really make sure you're in a safe space and you have people around you that are going to support you no matter what, because that is probably the most important thing in the world. Chosen family. So physical is important too. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought this up. So on the topic of coming out, our crisis counselors, you know, that's, that's one of the top things that uh, young people reach out to the Trevor Project for is um, advice around coming out. But something that the Trevor Project doesn't do, we, what we don't do is give prescriptive advice. So we would never encourage someone specifically to come out. We don't know their situation, right? We know them in the moment that they're contacting us. Um, but asking those guiding questions, checking in with them, uh, making sure that they're equipped with the questions that you're talking about. Do you have support? Do you have chosen family? Do you have people you can lean on? Are you in a safe situation? Those are the things that I think, you, listen, you don't have to be a crisis counselor to ask those questions. You don't need to be a crisis counselor to support your friends or your family who are thinking of coming out. Just making sure that they have those support systems are very important, especially for their physical safety. So keep that in mind, please. Okay, speaking of support, uh, we know that supportive and accepting adults are critical to youth mental health. Who was your role model growing up, and uh, how did they help you to get to where you are today? Ooh. I'm sure a few people come to mind. That's a uh, deep question. You gotta choose one. A great question. I'll, I'll go first. Okay, go ahead. RuPaul. <laughs> <laughs> well, mother. My, but mother, as I like to call her, but RuPaul was monumental for me. Um, 
growing up in Arkansas and saw her on Sabrina the Teenage Witch, I'll never forget. She did this. She turned into RuPaul, and she turned into RuPaul, the Glamazon. So I'll, that, that was very monumental to me, for me. But um, drag-wise, yes. And then I also, also look up to my div, Rihanna. I love her a lot. I love her, her unapologeticness, her when she walks into a room, it's effortless. I love that. And Diana Ross, that's my other one. <laughs> that's my teeth. Simone got three, so you can say Ew. you can say however many you want. I See, I'll say I'll, I'll say um, he's not with us any longer, but. It was my younger brother who sadly was my younger brother, but I treated like a big brother because he treated me like his little brother. Um, and all of my life, no matter what I was doing in my life, he's always been fully supportive of me. He was my safe space for me to come out to. And when I came out to him, he passed not a drop of judgment to me. And it, the way that regardless of his actions or anything that he did with his life, it's always been that he's taught me that you can live the life that you want to live and that you should be happy in the life that you want to live and that you should celebrate your life and no matter no matter what form that's in. And so um, he's always been a, a, a hero to me. And I wish he was here now, but he's not. But either way, um, he's still somebody that every single day of my life that I'm constantly learning from every single day. Oh my God, that was beautiful. Yeah, well, yeah. I don't want to follow that. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh my God, yeah. Now, now who's yours? <laughs> um, I guess looking back at someone who really shaped my life, I think growing up, I was like an art nerd. Like I was just always immersed in painting and drawing and I loved fashion so much. And when I was introduced to Alexander McQueen specifically, I was just like a dead. I thought those, I was like, this is exactly everything I want. It's like art, it's theater, it's everything. Like it was just you, the clothes and the collections would just show what he was feeling at the time. And I was like, I don't know where I want to go with my art, but I know I'm an artist and that's what I want people to feel when they see me. And that I just remember every collection and which one changed my life. One forced me to go to fashion school. I actually like got it like tattooed on my arm, like one of the models. Cause I'm yes. just so obsessed. It really did change my life. And I just knew seeing his runways and collections, I was like, no matter where I go with this art, I know I want people to see how I feel when they're looking at it. And I want to make a statement. And I think Alexander McQueen is probably the number one person that really shaped me as a person growing up. I love that. I love that. I love the cat. There, when we first started, there was a line of photographers here taking photos of us. And then when you pulled down your sleeve, they're all gone. <laughs> They go. Where they you go? never know what's, what I'm gonna do up here. <laughs> so that was a, that was such a simple question. We all ask that in schools and things like that. But you could kind of tell, right? That such a smatter, such a variety of answer. I want to make a point here: LGBTQ people, drag performers, trans and non-binary people. Not a monolith. We all have very unique experiences, and role models is one of those. Thank you very much for sharing those answers. Thank you. All right, so this is going to be a little game showy. We're going to do a speed round. It's going to be lightning round questions, okay? okay. So I'm going to ask a question, and then you're going to go down the line, answer really fast. Like one word? Have, well, we'll, we'll it depends. Should on I question. tighten my shoes or? <laughs> <laughs> Take them off. You're not running anywhere. Completely. Don't, don't run off. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask the question, and then boom, 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 okay? okay. You're going to have a second to think about it. Ooh. Sorry. Oh my gosh, you're freaking out. Look at your faces. Look at their faces. I, and, okay. and these are the days I say, thank like, God a con- Simone is first. I'm like, I'm like, I want to win. I think I did some new contest. I'm like, I need to win this. Like, <laughs> Competition mindset. Okay. This one's pretty easy, actually. Who do you stand? So that could be a fellow drag performer, pop star, etc. Who do you stand? Go. Oh my God, there's so many. I know. <laughs> there, there's, there's so many. Um... What are you saying? I don't Angela know. Bassett did the thing. Hey! I'm an Ariana Grande stan, low key. Weird. Yes. Also, Swifty. I'm like a girly. I'm like a girly in my music choices. Like, it's actually alarming. Tina Turner. All right. All right. Really great answers for having three seconds. All right. If the Olympics added lip syncing as a category, Olympics. And you had to lip sync for the gold medal. What song would you choose? The Boss, Diana Ross. 
Ooh. Die Young by Kesha. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, literally anything Rob Zombie has, I'll fucking kill you bitches. See what I'm saying about variety? Okay. <laughs> you got it all up here. Mine's, mine was between Hannah Montana and Rob Zombie, so I... <laughs> <laughs> all the variety. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh my God. A mashup of Hannah Montana and Rob Zombie. You get the best of both worlds for sure, Diva. Boom. <laughs> You're going to owe that person royalties when that happens. You are. Yo, get up here. What are you doing? <laughs> all right. LGBTQ affirming spaces are so vital for our community. What is your favorite queer space in America? You have to narrow it down to America. Favorite queer space. In all of America? What's the definition of a queer space right now? Like a club? <laughs> it could be. It could be. There's also resource cent- there are also resource centers, oh, right, community right. centers. Oh, I was going to say, I'm gay and I'd be at my house a lot. I was going to say, same. <laughs> same. And, and that that house pandemic, is, that's my favorite queer space. Yeah, that house is affirming. <laughs> uh, I'll say this, there's this bar that does a lot of amazing things for the community. Um, and it's in San Francisco. And I'll say Oasis because um, I had the opportunity to be there recently and Halloween. And I had like the best time every time I go there. There's nothing but respect. There's all types of bodies in the building, all types of queer people in the building, all types of everything. People just celebrating them, their lives, just living and it's just the best time there. Yeah. And the show is amazing, too. I'm going to probably, I'm going to just, I for really, it is my home. Because we have our space. I'm part of a house, House Babylon. And our space is like a queer, I like to think of it as a queer museum. So, like, and I'm, that is just my favorite place to be. I yeah. love being at home. <laughs> there is something to be said for community. That, that's true. And recharging. You were talking about that before. Also, her house is a queer museum. Like, she's not joking. It's like, it's like actually, so that's like not exaggeration. Um, mine's not, and mine's kind of boring, but the Los Angeles LGBT Center bitch got me together. They provide my hormones. They like force me to do checkups because, you know me, I'd be like, blood work, like, no thanks, boring. But they like keep me together. They keep me together. And literally, when I go in, I walk into the waiting room and there's like clueless places. Playing. Like I walked in for panels the other day for like HIV tests, like full panel everything, and then it was like High School Musical three, and I was like, nah, 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 like it was crazy. So I just love the LGBT Center. <laughs> Actually, give it up for the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Yeah, yeah, yes. They provide their program list is long. They do so much. For Girl, the Donatella did a yes. whole speech there the other day. Yes. Yeah, it's fierce. I love it there. Were you there? <laughs> No. Uh, <laughs> Phil Picardi, invite her. I, I saw her the day after. It's fine. <laughs> I, I said, see her. you tomorrow, bitch. It's fine. I can't make it today. <laughs> All right. So that concludes our speed round. It wasn't as speedy as I thought it would be, but y'all did great. Y'all did great. Yeah. Well, it was us. We wouldn't, yeah. we wouldn't go that fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. This is, this is one of the last sections before we go into audience Q&A. All right. So this is what's standing in between us and them. Okay. Okay. All right, so creating, yeah, reach out. Creating a more accepting world is this discussion topic. So the Trevor Project's research, it consistently shows that LGBTQ young people who have access to high family support, affirming schools, accepting communities, all of the things kind of have a similar theme, right? Acceptance and support. They report lower rates of attempting suicide. That is so powerful. So our question for you is, what does LGBTQ equality mean to you and how can we go about creating a better world for our young people? I mean, LGBTQ equality means everything to us. I feel like we could say it's literally our whole lives. And sometimes I'm, I am from a very Republican family in Arizona, like born and raised Catholic school my whole life, all of that jazz. And... We'll, I go back there and we have debates and stuff about things. We'll just, not debates, fights about stuff, <laughs> I guess. And some of like some weird Republican views, I'm like, okay, I get what you're saying, but like I'm not even, I can't even listen to your Republican views until we're all equal. Like it's insane to me that you're like, you're worried about small, you're like money stuff right now when people aren't equal. I was like, the second we all have rights, then maybe we can talk about money and stuff, girl. But for right now, Let's all get on the same playing field and then we can all, who knows, I'll be a Republican one day. I don't know. But until then, girl, we are, mm -mm. I I think equality for me looks like 
I mean, what it means to me and what it would look like is just queer people being able to walk down the street, enjoy their lives, be themselves the same way that anybody else could walk the street. Um, <clears throat> I think it's important especially for like our young people to feel like they have equality because truly the young people today are our future and the world that we want to have tomorrow the world that I that I'm hoping that where we could, that we could have is going to start with with our with the youth today you know it's the future 100% yes yes oh god i i y'all pretty much wrapped it up for me, but uh, I think it's not being afraid to be who you are and not feeling like you have to hide yourself or have to, you know, lie to the world about who you are. I think that's, I mean, that's the basis of equality. So LGBTQIA is people feeling like they can be with who they want to be, hold hands who they want to be, hold hands with, be in a relationship with who they want to be with and not feel judgment or harm or fear from the outside world, especially here in the lovely South. <laughs> this, when, I feel like when you said it looks like not being afraid, I feel like literally that was, to me in my mind, I thought, I thought about racism, everything, like literally just not being afraid to be a person and live your life. Wow. No, 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 let's acknowledge that. That's intersectionality. We're talking about intersectional identities right now. Absolutely. Not being afraid to live your intersectional identity in life. 100%. I love that. All right. We're coming to a close. Uh oh. You ready? We're about to go into QA from the audience. Wait, but before we do that, can we yeah. make some noise for the interpreter on the side? Yes. Hey! <laughs> and the other interpreter as well, who had on the very cute blue jacket. Yeah. Because they're definitely slaying today. I just wanted to give acknowledgement to everybody on the stage. Yeah. They have to keep up, they have to keep up with y'all. Hey, gorgeous, we got Mick. I love it so much. You're so hot. Fucking yes. Uh <laughs> right. Hey, everybody. Thank Did you so much for joining you? us at Southwest. West South by Southwest. We love you so much, and I'm glad you could join us. If you need anything, find me on social media at Jada, Jada E. Hall. Everywhere, including Instagram and Facebook. My phone number is... <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Wow. Big Slay. Thing. Thing. Those are some fast hands, mama. <laughs> Faster than our quick round. Everyone on stage <laughs> is working today. All right, so thank you all for sharing this space with us and you, especially y'all for participating in such an important conversation. We are going to shift into audience Q&A. <laughs> when I see this first question. <laughs> okay, I see this first question. Anonymous, ooh, drama. All right, Anonymous <laughs> asked... Brave. Who's winning season five? Oh, I almost said season five. <laughs> season 15. <laughs> oh, God. I thought I had the right answer Sasha for Sasha Colby! Yeah. <laughs> you see, I feel like it's either going to be Sasha or uh, Mistress. That's what I do love I have to say, I'm a, I, I'm a Mistress She's fan. She's funny I as am, hell. I'm, I'm going to say, fully, I'll say Sasha is icon down. Sasha or Mistress. Mistress is fun, girl. Mistress is fun. She's okay. the key. Yeah. I want her to read me in the back room. Kind of <laughs> same. Kind of same. All right, Anonymous, you have your answer. <laughs> All right, one more. Oh, also Anonymous. Ooh. RuPaul's Drag Race was instrumental to repairing the relationship with my mom after coming oh. out. Oh. Okay. Besides being fun to watch, do you feel the gravity and impact of the show? Oh, for sure. I think when we do the, when we do, do the meet and greets, people come up to us and tell us how the show or how we as an in individual queen have changed our lives. And it's really amazing and like it's humbling to see. And I, I enjoy the meet and greets too, because you get to really see how, how the show affects people. And they really, d people really do, it really does change people's lives. It's, it's, it's a humbling and very joyous thing to experience. I feel like, yeah, because it's crazy. Some we do the meet and greets, like you said, we do the meet and greets and we do them often and like thankfully for some reason y'all come back time and time again to support us guess that's sickening um and and the more you see some people you know come the sometimes the more confident you see them become the stronger they become um this I, there was a friend that i had from from back home in milwaukee and and before like even she was so quiet extremely 
personal, would never reach out. And now it's like performing live on stages, performed in Japan on a stage and it's just like living their best life. And before wouldn't would, Carly could communicate. So I like drag changes lives. And I'm like, if, if, even if I couldn't say that it changed anybody else's life out there, I know it changed mine. Yeah. I mean, I think like we were all saying, it's like instant how insane the impact is and how many people we get to meet and relate with. And like I was saying earlier, I get to grow because of the people's stories. I'm learning every day and be learning to be comfortable with who I am every single day. And I didn't even know that until I started meeting all of you guys and you guys showing me of the most amazing support ever. And I think um, me on Drag Race personally even healed like my relationship with my own family a lot. So they just got to see me be so happy and do what I do to my fullest extent. And they'd never seen me in drag before TV. So it was a moment. And I think if I had that personally, I'm sure so many other people are feeling that as well. All right, before we move on to the next question, Gottmik, I, I do want to say, did you pour any of that into your book? So you're, you're what you're talking oh, about with your family. Your what book? My book available on May 16th <laughs> called The Tea Guide with Gigi Gorgeous. Is that the book? I'm <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, the book is crazy. It's it's insane. I did I just recorded my audio book the other day and I was rereading because we've been working on this for like two years. So it was like I'm like, let me tell you a story about this one hate crime. I'm like, I wonder what I'm gonna say. Like I was literally like going back, like relearning what I was saying. And it's me and Gigi Gorgeous, a, she's a trans woman woman activist that changed my life being so open and she kind of taught me how to be so open and I was just rereading the stories and other people's stories we have Sasha Colby talk about her pageant life we have the first ever trans senator Sarah McBride talk about her trans story in the in politics it's just insane this book covers every aspect of every queer identity and I was reading this and I was like I think from when I wrote this it's like healed me and I've moved on and grown so much. And obviously what I'm saying in the book is still so valid and where I was at that point, but I've grown so much because of being open and honest with myself. So it's crazy. Writing a book, you just write a book, you guys, it'll, it'll help you. <laughs> All right. So you have therapy or write a book. Okay. Yes. Just write, just write it down. Actually, girl, when I'm on a plane and I get my notes app open, I'm a little drunk. You should read those notes apps. <laughs> <laughs> I go <That's>, off. <laughs> somebody submit a question about tweet drafts right now. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm just kidding. Please do not do that. All right. Okay, this one is a, <laughs> this one is a little tense. Yeah. So be ready for this, okay? I'm not going to read the whole question. Morgan asked, if you could speak directly to the lawmakers passing anti-drag and anti-trans policies across the states, what would you say? Um... I think, well, first, obviously, it's like so, what's going on is so frustrating for all of us. And my first instinct would just be like, fuck you guys, that's fucking insane. But I think it's so weird. You kind of have to step back. And like I was saying earlier, it's like these people don't even know anything about drag. They do not even know what a trans person is. They're just like picking low hanging fruit and be like, girl, this will be the tip of the iceberg. If we just start it here, we can like, carry on to even more crazy anti-LGBTQ laws. Like, so, oh, my earring fell. Okay, I didn't like that one. And um, so I think now I've just learned that even, no matter what rage I'm feeling, I just have to reel it in. And I would love to just kind of be like, look how happy I am. Look how, like, what? look at my art I'm doing and look at the people I'm connecting with are real people. And it doesn't matter what you're putting, what you're trying to do. We're not going to be like, oh, you passed a law. We're going to go home and go back in the closet. Like, we're going to still be here. So it's like, I would just love to show them how happy and like how we're literally family, you know, as a community. So that's what I would love for them to actually see and experience. And you're, yeah. Everyone in this room, you're a part of our family now too. I would say the same thing and like um, I think sometimes words to people are people can use words as like a weapon and they can use them in whichever way they want to they can use words to, to either to agree with you or to disagree with you and I think it would be great if somebody was ever willing to like like you said spend some quality time with queer people. Like, come over, I think girl. that I think anything <laughs> I'll you, change your mind. Nothing you could say, <laughs> nothing you could say would equal spending time with real people 
and experiencing and realizing that they are just like you, probably better people, but just like you. you Not probably. (laughs) Certainly better people. (laughs) No, you're right. There's a humanizing aspect when you're talking about people through legislation. That's all you see. It's very transactional. And when you actually get to meet and learn about and educate yourself around certain people and their identities, there's a humanization that happens. Yeah. Do you have any words for... You just said it's it's, it's educate yourself and know that what's the difference between drag, what's the difference between trans people, and just know that we're human at the end of the day and we have a right to exist just like you have a right to exist. And if they come for... If they can come for us, they can come for you too. So it's... That's what the reality is, is this is not really about telling somebody they can't do drag, honey. It's really about telling people how they can live their lives. So like for me, I'm like, I'm a drag artist. You know what? If I wasn't doing drag tomorrow, girl, if I had to be a fry cook, bitch, I could make it work for me. (laughs) But the reality of it is, is no matter what, where I go in my life, I will always be a queer person. And even if I wasn't doing drag, bitch, guess what? If you don't speak up now, tomorrow they'll be coming for queer people across the board, period. And then next it could be, you could be because you're, you have to be his. Hispanic or you because could be because you're black and you never know what it is so you have to like we talk about intersectionality everything that happens in this world moves together and it's better when we move when we move together to co- to complete this job like this mission of like speaking up is great to be like to speak to your a drag advocate or somebody you know with a platform and tell them to speak up but you, we all have to be taking our turns to speak up, and this is very important. So we all have to be with our family and our friends. Like, what would you say to somebody in your family who would be opposing to your lifestyle? How would you feel? And like, and and you have to like literally. I think everything in our lives starts at a grassroots level. It starts with us and the people around us. And 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 if you if you ain't ask somebody in your family that's not against what you're doing, how they're gonna turn it around? I feel like do that first, and then hold me accountable. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to do my job. But we all have to do it together. Yeah. And vote. Vote. And vote. You have to vote. The- I mean, the past year, there's a bunch of straight dudes sitting in a room that are saying, I don't think women should have abortions. I don't think men should be allowed to dress in dresses. And uh, let's just jump, like, put trans people in there too it's just like don't you have bigger fish to fry bitch like we are literally just living our lives being real people and how dare you try to control what we're doing like it's the weird it's like mind-blowing to me weird it's like come on other there's other things to worry about it's like coming to somebody's house and being like move the couch and i don't really like that painting take it down and also where's the bedroom you know, it's giving that. It's 100%. odd behavior. It's very that, yes. <laughs> Y'all have your answers. You know exactly And what I've only they would done say. that once. <laughs> you know exactly what they would say to those lawmakers. Okay, you have your answer. All right, we're going to retire audience Q&A for now. We want to have some closing remarks. We're going to move into a conclusion. All right, so again, thank you all very much again for sharing this space with us and participating in this conversation, even the audience with your Q&A, thank you very much. Uh, We do have a couple closing things. First, if you live in Texas, please swing by the Capitol, support Equality Texas, and drop a card to show your support for trans young people. The rally is over, but they are still welcoming support during the hearings today. You can also check in with them at info at equalitytexas.org. One more time info at equalitytexas.org, okay? Another, who's performing at Oil Can Harry's tonight. Yes. Me too, it's totally me. No, seriously, there's gonna be a performance at Oil Can Harry's tonight. If y'all are in town, if you're staying for a little longer, what time is the show? That's a fabulous question. Great question. <laughs> but we but will But you know be what? There. We'll be there. <laughs> all right, just come. You'll see so them. You'll see come them. all night. I thought I would throw it to you and y'all would have a time. Okay. Nope. <laughs> Go over there. <laughs> we were waiting. <laughs> it works, mama. Okay. Um, all right. So we are closing out. If we have learned anything, it is that we have a long road ahead of us to protect safe and affirming spaces for LGBTQ young people and to show young people that they belong and can be who they are. So with that in mind, we do have a huge favor to ask of you. We have hundreds of shirts with a strong message that show adults how they can make a difference. 
We are a scrappy team here, the Trevor Project. We just have a few people here. Uh, so we're trying to get every single shirt out here in Austin. We know y'all are gonna be here for a while. Y'all have other communities, other parties, other panels, uh, and groups you'll be hanging out with today. So on your way out, please join our community. Grab not just one for yourself, grab 10, grab 20, 20 shirts, hand them out to anyone in your community. I am serious, please. Distribute these among Austin, and then everyone will see uh, the good work that the Trevor Project is able to do and service our community, okay? Yes, yes. All right, one more time. Keep that round of applause going. A massive, massive, massive thank you to our guests on stage. Keep that going, yes. Oh, y'all wanna stand? Okay, yes, everyone stand. They deserve it, yes. That is for you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you very much. Love you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much.